Welcome back to another show. Uh, today we have a lot of questions from social media. We don't have any questions from our, our green room today simply because the link for some reason didn't work, but no problem because of that, this way we could focus more on all the all your questions from social media. And so you can just start asking anything that I say is not gonna be meant to cure any diseases or replace your medical care. If I do recommend eating a salad, check with your doctor first. I don't want to be <laughs> held responsible for any type of consequences that occur from you eating um, excessive amounts of whole foods, salads, meats, things like that. So I'm just the messenger, Steve. That's right. So just stick to the recommended by the food pyramid, two cups of sugar per day and see your doctor in the morning. Uh, and by the way, uh, here's some other ways to get some non-recommended stuff, and that is uh, Dr. Burke's app. And we know that many of you today will be heading to Grandma's uh, for Christmas or other holiday festivities. And you can listen, by the way, without watching Dangerously. Listen to Dr. Berg uh, on his app. He's got some audio stuff, and his soothing voice will take you safely to your destination. So that, and then when you're not driving, if you're bored with your husband and sitting in the right seat or vice versa, you can actually watch the video. So there's so much great utility from this. Uh, you know, you're going to find it just a great asset uh, to uh, countering two cups of sugar to, uh, per day. Steve, well, Steve uh, you know, someone made a comment. They said, um, gosh, your, your voice is so soothing. I actually play it before I go to bed to help me sleep. So um, maybe driving and listening to my voice might not be a good thing, but just test it out. If you get tired, flip to the radio, crank up some music, stay awake. But sometimes I, li I listen to a lot of audio audiobooks when I'm driving. Um, and, uh, you know, if they have the certain voice that they can kind of get into this thing, it's like you start dozing off. It's like, you know, it really depends on that, uh, how the book's laid out. There's so many books that I read that aren't that exciting. So I have to kind of sift through a lot of the fluff to get to the good stuff sometimes. Um, yeah. You know, they actually have so, a feature yeah. where you can put uh, 1.25 or 1.5 speed it up. And you, you know, know I, I can't figure that out. I haven't figured that out yet. So I'll have to work on that. Okay. Anyway, that's, uh, that's swell. But listen, folks, again, as, uh, as the good doctor said, we are going to just love social media to death. Uh, because that's what we've got. And so there'll be no pesky participants in the green room. No, we love them all, but they're not on today. So you guys have got our full attention. And so why don't we uh, start off with the first question from social media of the day. And this sounds like a familiar one, a familiar one, excuse me. Why do I always fall off the keto wagon every six weeks? I usually lose about 10 kilograms every six weeks, but I always lapse after six weeks. How can I maintain the keto consistently? Well, I think, um, you know, the question is um, some people give, give up or go off track for various reasons. Maybe they get bored. Maybe they stopped getting results. Maybe you got your results were too good. And then, you know, you're like, wow, maybe I don't need to do this. So I think in some ways it's good to go off the keto once in a while, especially in the beginning, to prove to yourself that staying on it is a good thing. Um, that way you can convince yourself. Uh, for me, it took me many, many years to stay consistent um, because I always had a reason or a justification to go off. But um, to make it more interesting, you know, you you start watching more videos, uh, better recipes that taste better, higher quality ingredients, uh, you know, keto desserts, things like that, that can make it just more pleasurable if you need that. Um, but, you know, I have eventually got to a state, I don't know if, anyone else got to this state yet, maybe not very many people, but where I can kind of eat for health and I can just get in this mode where I can just do it consistently. It's just automatic. I do it. Um, especially because, um, you know, I'm very, very aware of foods and what they do. And I, I found out what works. So I do it consistently and I rarely go off the program and I don't have a hard time with that. Some people do. Um, so I think it's just learning about your body. Also this DNA testing, I think will be a very huge thing for many people as I'm going to be educating a lot of people on this and try to make it simple, but there's a lot there and to, to simplify, you really have to understand it. So um, I'm still chipping away, but if you really appreciate um, kind of like um, what makes up your genes and, and your weaknesses and the, and the problems that you're going to have, 
potentially if you don't be consistent. <laughs> that was that's enough motivation for a lot of people. I mean, especially if you can, you know, avoid a problem that is right in your genetics and you're at high risk. Like, okay, so I'm going to start now and stick with it. Um, I think that's probably a better um, motivi- motivator than other things. Very good. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's kick off with our first question. Uh, and here it is, Dr. Berg. All right. What is the primary sign of a carbohydrate deficiency? Boy, that's interesting. I didn't think I'd hear that question out of you. Uh, but anyway, dig into that audience and let's go back to uh, our sole audience today, social media. Carol from YouTube, is it okay to have uh, broccoli sprouts uh, with dairy? I was told it's not a good combination for you. I, I don't. I don't think there's a problem with it, uh, unless you have a an allergy to casein or a lactose intolerant. But um, no, you can mix it. Um, I don't see a problem at all. Wow, I think broccoli and cheese is on the periodic table. I mean, that's just about as uh, normal as apple pie. Oops, don't eat that. Okay, William from YouTube. What's the best way to treat a tongue infection? Well, it sounds to me if it could be like a, a yeast or a, a fungus or a candida that grows in the tongue, um, but it could be some other pathogen. The microbiome in your mouth um, is very, very important. And when we use too many chemicals like doing fluoride treatments or over sterilizing, you know, things like that, um, or medications or drugs, whatever, or lacking nutrients. Uh, we start getting an overgrowth of the wrong thing in our mouths, uh, especially candida and fungus and mold and other bacteria that shouldn't be there. So um, it tells us that there's uh, you have to reestablish that that microbe. And um, I would uh, start doing food probiotics, starting with a raw sauerkraut. Never consume pasteurized sauerkraut. Because it kills the microbes. Why would you ever take such a great product that's so filled with microbes and sterilize it by killing it with heat? Doesn't make sense. So you want the raw sauerkraut, you want um, the kimchi, and uh, you want um, maybe even some kefir and down that. And that's going to actually start to reestablish the flora. Now realize if you have um, candida, uh, like a white tongue, whatever, you're going to have to completely avoid sugar because the sugar is what they love to live on and they'll keep growing unless you cut that sugar out. Um, so that's, that's, I guess that's my answer. I'm sticking to it, Steve. Well, I don't blame you. And I hope it won't continue to stick to William. A little drum roll there and I'll get rid of that. That sounds awful. Okay, Presana, I hope I didn't butcher your name, dear, from India on YouTube. Simply wants to let you know that uh, she used to have unhealthy eating habits, sleep disorders, and obesity. After following Dr. Berg, that's you, healthy keto and intermittent fasting for a short while, I've already lost 20 kilograms. Thank you, she says. And by the way, that is interesting. In India, where uh, there are a lot of vegetarians, that's hopeful news. Hey, you know, one thing I like about India is they have very low carbs there. Um, They have very little sugar. So that's really good. Yeah, no such thing as non. No, no, not at all. Um, Yeah, and I've heard that the some of the Indian restaurants that I go to in America are not quite like the foods in India. I think same thing with Chinese restaurants. You know, you go to the actual country. Like Steve, I'm sure you've uh, been to an Italian pizzeria or a restaurant in the states, right? Indeed. Um, well, I'm just going to let you know it's uh, extremely opposite or different than if you actually go to the Italy and actually go to one of those restaurants. It's completely different. It's the American version of some of these other foods are just ridiculous. Don't tell me they don't have Pizza Hut in Italy. I'm going to die. Oh, that would be that would be really really bad. <laughs> Sacrilege, huh? That's terrible. Okay, back to social media. Nazia. Uh, from YouTube, please discuss ways to open block fallopian tubes. Well, of course, you know, go go first to try to um, get your basic eating plan in to see what happens. But um, 
specifically for that, if you have a problem in the uh, fallopian tubes, which is the connection between the uterus and the ovary, um, I would consume a supplement to help, maybe help support that called Overtrophin PMG and Eutrophin PMG. These are standard process products. I used to use them in my practice, but you could actually support fertility and um, certain glands by those two products, which um, is pretty good. But um, again, um, I would, I, I wouldn't, I would try the basics first and try to just get your diet healthy because who knows your body might come back and open up those fallopian tubes, which um, I have no idea what's causing them. I like to take uh, a higher look at it and instead of trying to treat a specific symptom, like what could be really behind that? Well, I know that there's a lot of problems like endometriosis, for example, that can put scar tissue in the fallopian tubes, external and internal. <clears throat> so I would just go with the basics first and then um, and see what you can do with that before you start to, you know, try something invasive. Very good. Well, we certainly hope that you clear that up and have some great babies. Okay, let's see. The audience is on it as usual. Uh, they took the first quiz question very seriously and have demonstrated that by answering it. And it asks, what is the primary sign of a carbohydrate deficiency? Uh, and 65% of them said primary effect is ketosis and weight loss. 15% say hair loss. 15% say weakness or fatigue. And 5% say reduced brain function. This is interesting because um, if you type this up, and some of you have typed in Google, the first, I don't know how many pages are just filled with all the, the bad things, the side effects. And I mean, my whole thought is... Um, if you tell a lie um, multiple times by multiple different sources, does that tend to make it true? If you put a lie on a credible website, does that make it more true? Um, not if it's a lie. And they're just lying through the teeth through this uh, concept of that there's negative things by reducing your carbs. And that's really what they're pushing. It's like, um, um, and you go through like, oh, you're going to start craving junk food. You're going to start having um, cognitive problems. You're going to start being hungry all the time. You're going to have constipation. You're going to have, you're going to, your body's going to go into a state of ketosis. And we all know that ketosis occurs when you, in, during starvation. And um, when you lose all this water weight temporarily, you lose your electrolytes and develop arrhythmias. And that can lead to strokes. So you could put so many doubts in someone's mind by reading this crap. And if I didn't know otherwise, I'd probably be discouraged from doing keto. Um, the, the true uh, signs or symptoms of low carb, if you do it correctly, you know, you're lowering your carb below 50 to 30 grams, um, is this. You lose your cravings. You lose your hunger. You have better cognitive function, you have better mood, you lose your belly fat, and you finally, for the first time in your life, you might be burning actual fat because to do that, you have to reduce your carbs, which is a new concept for a lot of people. So there are so many wonderful things in the opposite of what they tell you. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, if you take a look at um, what they'll recommend, usually by a dietitian, is that we need carbs because our brain and our muscles require carbohydrates. Um, no, that's not true. Any carbs that we need, we, our bodies can make them. In fact, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Our bodies, if we need it, we can get it from other things. Um, the other thing is that uh, um, we need fat. Fat's essential, essential fatty acids. We also need essential amino acids as protein. So that's those two foods are essential, but not the carbs. And um, so there's a lot of bad things happen. And the recommended amount of carbs that they tell you to eat is between um, 200 and I think it's uh, 288 to 325 grams of wow. carbs per day. If you have a 2000 calorie diet, I mean, like, it's 10 times the amount of carbs that you need. Um, that is guaranteed to make you fat, tired, brain fog, give you dementia. So anyway, there's an interesting 
you know, push to get everyone to keep eating carbs. And I think you guys know why, but uh, I will be doing a video on that today. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that, but it's uh, a carb deficiency and they have carb deficiency diseases. They talk about, um, you can get uh, ketosis, like ketoacidosis. Well, first of all, that only occurs if you're a type one diabetic and you forget to take your insulin. They don't, they don't mention those little details. So again, you have to be really, um, suspect. And when you kind of go on doing your searches on Google, um, because we all know that, um, Google's just filled with credible facts. Incredible. Hey, let's go to the, the uh, green room after all, Steve, welcome to the show. All right. A little hey, slight Steve. of habit. That's right. Anyway, I just wanted to echo again, my, you can see I'm beautiful now. My weight's down. No, really. I'm like 45 pounds down since I met Dr. Berg. However, my motivation is not weight. It still is carbs drive me mad. If I eat tons of sugar and stuff, it is the emotional component that drives me back to discipline, not yeah. gaining five pounds. It, so that is an absolute yeah. absurd notion to suggest that uh, you better eat some more Cocoa Puffs um, or you're going to have brain fog. That is the dumbest thing I've heard in the last five minutes. So there you have it. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go on to the next question. And here it is. Okay, which cell in your body is responsible for the majority of detoxification, turning poisons into harmless particles? There's one specific cell that do, does the lion's share of that work. What is the name of that cell? All right, very good. Let's take a look around the w world. Uh, this is a big holiday a week for um, uh, us here in the uh, States and some Western countries, but... There's all sorts of celebration going on around Dr. Berg's show, and here's where they're coming from. We'd like to say hello to our viewers from the UK, Canada, Pakistan, Mexico, Taiwan, Curacao. Did I say that way? I think so. Israel, Malaysia, India, yeah, Uganda. Curacao. Thank you, sir. Denmark, Nepal, the Netherlands, Kuwait, Brazil, Libya, Bangladesh. Speaking of India, uh, let's see, Jordan, Finland, Nigeria. Uh, Estonia, Sri Lanka, Italy, Algeria, Switzerland, all, uh, Austria, Bali, nice place, Georgia, uh, Eritrea, I hope I said that right, uh, Eritrea, I think uh, uh, he spelled that, Terry spelled it for me phonetically because he knows what a dope I am at pronunciation, thank you Terry, Singapore, Kurdistan, Croatia, Papua New Guinea, Jamaica, Colombia, Poland, Russia, the Czech Republic, Germany, Chile, Trinidad and Tobago, Japan, Croatia, Qatar, Greece, Ghana, Vietnam, France, uh, Nicaragua, uh, Oman, South Africa, Argentina, Scotland, going there with my daughter in the spring, Serbia, Peru, Slovakia, uh, Bhutan, another new one, Zambia, and all across these United States. Be careful with your traveling, boy. We have got some blizzardy stuff going on, so maybe it's better just to stay home and watch Dr. Berg's app and uh, don't eat carbs. So let's uh, thank you for that. Let's go <laughs> right back to um, social media, which is the only place we've got to go back to. Uh, Shakila from Facebook, can blood cleansing help treat chronic disease? Well, like I'm guessing you're talking about alternative treatments like ozone therapy, um, things like that, which I, I actually, I really like that therapy. Um, I was, I, I think I, yeah, I did. I did have it done once. And, uh, but you know, I, even though I like it because it uh, kind of purifies the blood, you know, I always like to, it's kind of like a, you're treating the tip of the iceberg. Like how do you long-term fix the problem? How do you cleanse the blood? Where does the blood come from? Uh, the kidneys are supposed to filter the blood, but to make your blood very uh, healthy, it's really a, it's, you got to start changing your diet. You got to start changing your environment, uh, reduce the toxicity that you're exposed to. Steve, did you realize that um, every single year, and I'm just talking about in the U.S., there's a production either by the U.S. or imported 27 trillion pounds of chemicals. 27 trillion pounds of chemicals. That wow. is... Um, that's a lot of chemicals and it comes down to being exposed to literally 250 pounds of chemicals per day. Uh, so, so we're bathing in the chemicals. So guess what that's going to happen to our blood. And that's going to be, 
going to be situations. So, um, of course, I'm going to uh, stay tuned for uh, a, a video on that topic because um, there are certain things that um, you can do very, very inexpensively to keep uh, your your blood and your your cells clean and to counter uh, these chemicals that are building up, unfortunately. Wow, I understand that we uh, we as Western folks eat at least a credit card's worth of plastic every week. So, yeah. And, yeah, that's definitely... That's at least one thing. Yep. <laughs> I don't want to know about the rest. They're probably really gross. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Now let's go to Denise from YouTube. Please discuss ways to address gastroparesis. Did I say that right, Doc? Yeah. So gastroparesis is a condition where your digestive system is very, very slow. And it's not, you're not digesting and things are just not functioning. They're, they're sluggish. Um, that is really a problem with the vagus nerve that controls the digestive system. But if we take a look at what's behind that, the number one cause of the vagus nerve problem is a lack of B1, thymine. Thymine helps you make acetylcholine, which is the main neurotransmitter for the vagus nerve. So that B1, you know, uh, if you don't have enough B1, which is very common, uh, you'll get symptoms like gastroparesis, constipation, a lack of hydrochloric acid. I mean, the majority of your hydrochloric acid is is triggered by this B1. I mean, so this is kind of a, another little link that is really important. And if you don't know about it and you're deficient in B1, it leads to massive bad consequences to the entire digestive tract, especially if you're not producing hydrochloric acid or you have incomplete digestion. Now the question is, how do you become deficient? Well, refined carbs, refined sugars, drinking too much coffee, tea, and there's many other reasons, but uh, um, B1 is uh, probably the most important water-soluble vitamin uh, because it just influences so many things. But definitely that's what you need. Just start taking some B1, find a natural version, uh, and watch what happens to your gastroparesis. You just may find that it might magically disappear, but of course, don't mention my name when you go to your doctor. Not a word. Okay, I always love this. Once we give a shout out, there's others that say, hey, what about us? And those people want to make sure that we are acknowledging Cameroon, Romania, uh, Tanzania, Iran, Sweden, Dubai, Turkey, and Ethiopia. Well, you're certainly welcome. Uh, and we're glad to have you on board, uh, not eating Cocoa Puffs, I hope, uh, if they have them in those various places. Rena, however, from Facebook, can alcohol-induced gastrointestinal damage be corrected with keto and IF? I, I think to, to a large degree it can, um, but I think you're going to need some additional things too to help um, correct it. And... Um, well, you know, if you do the healthy version of keto and you include more probiotics um, and get a nice diversified group of microbes living in your intestine, intestines, that can actually help fortify and help <clears throat> build up the mucus layer that's needed in the GI tract. That mucus layer is really what's missing with so many people and their health problems. And that mucus layer is generated by eating healthy and having enough microbes and uh, making sure they're doing their job. Um, when you lose the mucus layer, you lose your immune system because then you have um, less of a buffer for these pathogens to invade. And then you start getting autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases. So um, that mucus layer is going to be really key to maintain your health. And, uh, and you can have a good start by doing the healthy keto. Very good. Okay. The audience is rolling the dice with 100% uh, agreement uh, of the question which said, which cell in your body is responsible for the majority of detoxification? And 100% of our audience said it's the mitro, my, excuse me, mitochondria. Hmm. Well, uh -oh. they're not quite 100% there. Uh, I, it's, it's called the hepatocyte, mm. hepatocyte. Wow. Okay. That's the liver cell. And that liver cell is very interesting. It's uh, very robust. It takes a beating and it keeps on ticking and it can 
uh, get hammered and it can regenerate uh, better than many other cells. I mean, here, here you, you have a night out in the town, you drink all this alcohol, kill off your liver, and then the next couple of days grows back if, if you do all the right things. But the point is that it's a, re, ro, re, uh, a robust uh, cell that basically has these enzymes that can turn poisons into like fat-soluble poisons into harmless water-soluble poisons for the elimination. So there's various things that you can do to trigger it. And, um, but we have our, uh, this system in our cells right now that uh, have, has the ability to keep you protected. You just need to know what to eat to trigger them and uh, keep them working and keep the poisons um, at a minimum. Um, but um, I'll show you, I guess um, this is the book that you need to read. It's not that it's easy reading. <laughs> you can probably do it in a weekend, but this is the book on toxicology. Okay. So you can read that and then um, <clears throat> learn about all the um, chemicals in the environment and what they do. But, this is a lot of data on the liver cell and the importance of supporting your liver and getting it healthy. And I have a lot of videos in the liver. So um, stay tuned for more on that. Topic. Wow. Well, guess what? I've got some exciting news. It wasn't 100%. It was 99%. Uh, Terry just found out that uh, Shivani on YouTube, she was the only one who had the correct answer. So good for you, uh, Shivani. You should be jumping up and down. Uh, uh, because you are one out of the crowd that stuck with the correct answer uh, besides Dr. Uh, Berg. So let's see. Let's uh, continue to sort through uh, social media. Uh, oh, poor Carolyn from Facebook is having problems with constipation and irregularity. <clears throat> I take your gallbladder supplements and liver cleanse, um, and, um, you know, she's constipated. Uh, and have to cut back on dairy. Uh, can I be eating too many cruciferous vegetables? Yeah, yeah, you can. So, so um, the first thing I would try if I had constipation, especially if it you developed it when you're on keto, <laughs> is either to first decrease or even increase the amount of vegetables that you consume because if you have too much fiber or not enough fiber it can, it can create that symptom so you might need to make adjustments you you know what was interesting to me is that when i because uh, i experiment on a lot of things years years ago when i even started um started the atkins diet you know i noticed when i just started eating more protein and i didn't have any vegetables at that that time um boy my digestive system work like a charm. No more constipation. Because I, in my mind, I thought it's always the fiber, it's the fiber, the fiber. Well, for some people it is, some people it's not. Because um, sometimes you just don't have the microbe diversity to digest the fiber. So this is really a very important topic. If we take a look at 50 years ago and now, you know, I, I think the, the biggest missing factor in our health is the missing diversity of the microbiome and what it can do for digestion. And that, of course, it's reason why, I mean, like everything that we're doing right now, we're just sterilizing, we're killing off things, the antibiotics, the, the foods, the pasteurization, the sterile, the canned foods, the cooked foods. So if you were just to build up this microbiome um, and this means like slowly adding a variety of different plants as well. At first, you might um, follow my recommendations and start adding more salad and go, my gosh, I'm bloated, I have gas. Well, cut it back. All that means is you just don't have the, the right microbes. If you start to diversify and, and have just a little bit over a period of time, all of a sudden you're gonna start growing the microbes to help you digest that food as well as make the enzymes. And so, um, and this would eliminate a lot of additional problems. You may find you're no longer um, susceptible to kidney stones because you have the microbes to break down oxalates or you have the microbes to help you dismantle uric acid so you don't have gout anymore. Um, I want to just share something. I just got the results, um, final results from the, the beef study. So I sent in my 
beef. It's called the beef nutrient density study. I sent my beef for my farm, right? And this is fascinating because if you look at this page right here, can you Steve, see that okay, Steve? Yeah. I uh, can't quite read the things, but I see the okay. big green see column. See this green on. bar right here? Yes, sir. This is Dr. Berg's um, cattle, beef, I sent in. See how much higher it is than the grass-fed group and the grain-fed group? Wow. This is for phytonutrients. That, that's plant-based chemicals. Who would ever know that there are plant-based chemicals, a lot of them, in beef? Apparently... A lot more in my beef. They wanted to know what am I doing so different than some of these other farms. And what's interesting about my farm is that um, I don't do the typical uh, thing where I'm growing like four different grasses for the cattle. Um, I let them consume all the weeds. There's a much wider variety of weeds or plants and herbs uh, than actual grasses. And apparently... <laughs> That helps the diversity of microbes that then build these phytonutrients. So the same studies are, are done um, on humans. If you increase the diversity of different plants and certain, certain foods, all of a sudden your microbes will adapt. So you might want to do it gradually, but you can um, then build up more immune system, more health. Um, but it's an area that's very interesting. And uh, I happen to just get lucky and do something that, showed a lot of benefits for these biomarkers for your health. Um, I mean, I have 500 pounds of that beef in my freezers right now, and uh, I'm very motivated to start eating that on a regular basis now, now that I know <laughs> how healthy it is. It's incredibly healthy, so um, much better than the average. Oh, that's incredible. You'll be the next Methuselah. We'll see in a couple centuries. Uh, let's see, Rodrigo, and this is an interesting question because – uh, everyone has jumped on the keto wagon. Here's keto candy and keto this, that, and the other, but is it really? So Rodrigo from Facebook is asking, will any of these ingredients raise my insulin? Vegetable glycerin, organic stevia extract, um, natural French vanilla, uh, ethyl alcohol, 12% ethyl alcohol, et cetera. You know, you got to be really careful with some of these ingredients. And I don't, I don't really know because I'd have to see the label and like even some of the, um, a lot of the flavorings in the powders, in the different powders that people get keto or not. And the supplements and the flavorings. I recently learned of this by talking to several manufacturing companies that make vitamins that work with thousands, tens of thousands of com com companies supplement companies um i'm the uh, apparently i was the only only company or a uh, person to approach them and say listen I don't, I don't none of my products can have maltodextrin or uh, or corn syrup and they're like kind of shocked they're like really this has never been asked i says how many companies um use this these ingredients they go they they all do i said what so they're using um these other ingredients in there because it's a little bit cheaper, unfortunately. And um, they're not demanding to have these maltodextrin free or glucose free products. So that's just another interesting factoid that I recently realized. And uh, uh, unfortunately, here um, <laughs> you're getting supplements with hidden sugars. So with these keto snacks and things, you know, they're introducing these new fibers, the, the corn soluble fiber, and it's keto friendly and the, the tapioca fiber. I, I honestly, I just would stay away from it. There's no long-term state safety studies. Who knows what it's going to do to your microbiome. There's even a study I read that it creates toxicity in mice. Okay. They haven't done the human studies yet, but you know what? I always like to let let everyone else uh, experiment on it for, for several decades. And then I'll see if it works. I don't like to be the first one experimenting to like someone I know, um, um, has cancer. And then what they're doing is they're, they're going to do a, enroll in a cancer study. Personally. Um, I would prefer if someone else did the study first and then tell me if it worked or not, then, then to be one of the Guinea pigs. So anyway, Interesting. Okay. And here's an uh, uh, interesting question. It certainly interests me and maybe others. 
Lovely Fish from YouTube, please share your opinion on the nutritional value of CBD oil. It seems more and more people are taking it as an alternative to vitamin supplements. I mean, I've heard so many people talk about it as a cure for virtually everything. It's starting to sound like snake oil a little bit, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, this, this is another one of the supplements that are really, everyone's getting on the bandwagon and it's a new thing. Um, some of it has traces of THC and maybe some of it doesn't. You have to get certified. I, honestly, I, I'm the research is not quite there long term. I know a lot of people are going to probably get pissed at me because I'm not some supporting it for some reason, but I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I, uh, I'm not on the bang when I'm not going to drink that Kool-Aid right now. So I, I just don't do it. I don't recommend it. Um, I just don't, I definitely don't like, uh, traces of THC in my, uh, you know, even with my DNA testing, they actually evaluate uh, different pathways um, to see what happens when, if you did, were exposed to THC, right? Um, and um, it's it's like increased risk of psychosis. I'm like, uh, no, thank you, no, thank you. So um, anyway, that's just my viewpoint, and um, I'm not. Um, uh, there's many other things that uh, can help inflammation. I'm really interested in. Uh, getting rid of inflammation, but doing it in a way that, um, it get, gets deeper to the root problem. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's wise. I, I hope and I pray, and I think it really does probably have some beneficial, um, you know, attributes, but the fact that people say it does virtually everything, uh, you know, starts to sound suspect. It will literally cure any and everything. And that, uh, in its face, uh, gives me pause, but Hope the people that are using it and find it uh, helpful uh, continue to do so. Uh, Judy from Facebook, how to best treat stomach ulcers? Some of these uh, stomach ulcers come from H. pylori, okay? That's a microorganism. And in order for an ulcer to occur, your environment of the stomach has to change first. And I personally had an ulcer. And... Uh, it, I know it's directly related to just your foods. You're eating junk foods and you're not um, eating the right things. So as far as a remedy goes, um, uh, some people use zinc carnosine. Other people use um, sulforaphane, which is another good remedy, which is uh, from broccoli sprouts. Um, you can also get sulforaphane from cabbage. Um, so it can actually kill off this uh, H. pylori so you can get rid of the ulcer. Um that's that's the remedies and then of course change your diet in the meantime okay very good uh let's see uh one woman this is interesting i'm not sure if there's any um health benefits uh for this but karen from youtube i used to have half moons on my fingernails when i was a little girl but now as an adult i no longer have them and she wants them back now i bet everyone in the audience is looking at their fingernails because i did but uh, but is there uh, is she in any kind of trouble with not having half moons as an adult? <clears throat> Steve, it's a really it's a really popular thing now to have those half moons. Um, <clears throat> this relates to an iron deficiency. Um, so what what you want to do is make sure you have enough iron. Now, how do you do that? Do you take an iron supplement? No, you don't do that. You want to get it from food, and um, there's a huge difference between the iron in plants versus the iron in animal meats. So, um, which I have videos on, but I would recommend getting it from, you know, liver or uh, red meat, things like that. High quality grass fed grass finished. And, um, then you'll get the iron that you need, but your iron could also come from another thing. Um, it could come from a B12 deficiency too. And there's a lot of genetic things that relate to that too, but it's, I'm not getting into, but, um, Watch my videos on all the different causes of uh, anemia. And because um, I think that the lack of that uh, Luna um, half moon on your um, fingernails is just the tip of the iceberg. I think it, it goes much deeper. All right, very good. Let's see here. Uh, uh, Heromum, uh, Harum, or whatever your name is, sir or ma'am, from YouTube. How can I? fix anal stenosis caused by a laser hemorrhoid procedure. I'm sorry for asking that, <laughs> Dr. Ferg. I'm not sure that's such an obscure question, but unfortunately got zapped by a laser 
uh, and uh, it's got stenosis, which I guess is right, the narrowing of that. A dilator has helped, but I'm only 22. Do I need a dilator for the rest of my life? I don't know if you have any comment on that, Dr. Bird, but it sounds awful. I think, you know, the best thing to do is to do the uh, maybe, you know, topical vitamin E oil, which helps uh, reduce scarring. But uh, anything hemorrhoid related, always think colonsonia root. That's the best remedy. And that supports the liver because um, um, hemorrhoids are, are a problem with your venous structure. So it's a circulatory issue. And the, um, the colonsonia root tends to be a really good remedy to kind of uh, fix that problem. Um, but ultimately, it's a problem with the liver. So it seems like we all come back, we finally always come back to this liver as being um, the source of so many issues. Wow, Marsha from YouTube says, I'll take 10 pounds of your beef, please. A little roadside stand, yeah, Doc, and you will I, make a fortune. It's interesting because I even, I told some of my friends, I'm like, you, you want some beef? And they're, they're all like, uh, no, 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 we're fine. All of a sudden I show them the report. They're like, oh, where can I get some beef? I'm like, uh, <laughs> actually, I'm not, I can't sell it. But um, um, I, I'm just going to teach people what I'm doing and I'll do videos on it so you can grow your own beef in your backyard and um, do the same thing. But it's a, I want to do a full um, video on it because it's actually quite fascinating. Some of the other value, I mean, like there's this thing called um, advanced glycation end products. Now this is an, a biomarker or an indicator of something bad in your body, you know, chronic disease. It's a bad indicator. It's a, it's an indicator that there's a poor health. Well, Apparently, my beef had this, 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 the lowest amounts. And my question, I had no idea that was in beef. I had no idea homocysteine was in beef. So this is like a B vitamin deficiency. Um, so apparently, there's, um, you know, all the bad things that we find in our body, the indicators, they're, they're in animals. And so it would be good to know <clears throat> if what we're eating, are we eating sick animals and plants or are we eating healthy animals and plants. And does that relate to our health? I, I think it might, Steve. I think there's an old, what's the old saying? You are what you eat, I something like that. Makes sense. Yeah, well, that's exciting, uh, Dr. Berg. We're all anxious to see the continued reports that come down from that. And they will just be wringing our hands with jealousy that we don't have a slab of that. But maybe some people are listening and we'll get some better organic uh, meats, etc. in the future. Okay, let's go to our next quiz question for the day, and there it is, Dr. Bird. Okay, what is the best speci a speci a specific blood test to test for cancer? Mm, that's a good thing to know. All right, hop on it, audience. All right, Jana Toon from Facebook, are dairy-based probiotics safe? You know, I, I, I like them. I like them, unless you have a, a, an allergy to them. Um, and I don't know, of course, what companies are, are you know, using d good methods and things like that. But generally, uh, I think I think they're fine um, because they they like to eat the milk sugar, and you can grow these microbes on dairy. Um, hopefully, it's a healthy version of dairy. Um, don't forget, um, you can get a lot of probiotics from not only fermented foods, but raw plants that come from good soils apparently there's a whole bunch of microbiome inside that plant that helps to populate our guts and so this is something brand new you, you wouldn't think that there's actual probiotics in plants but there is but i'm not telling you to start eating just a large amount but if you had that like i said before that variety from like the farmer's market i think that would be really good for your gut but not just from the eating, feeding the fiber to your microbes, but just giving you microbes. I mean, that's, where do you think the cows and uh, these other animals, the goats and the sheep, where do you think they get their rumen or their microbiome? It, it comes right from this, the uh, plants and that comes from the soil. So it's all just being recycled. Um, I mean, if you evaluate the microbes in a plant that a cow eats, um, their, their microbiome bacteria, their bacteria that are in our gut, are in the guts of animals. So um, it's a nice recycling system. 
and um, it kind of just got my interest in creating a video on what would happen if you had were completely sterile and you had no microbes in your body. What would happen to your health? How long would you live? What would happen if you were on a permanent antibiotic? Boy, that would be something else. Wow, interesting. Mike from Facebook, I love that you have your own farm. That's a goal of mine. And let me tell you something, Mike, I've had the great honor of being there. And you come over this rise and look down upon the most beautiful scene you've ever seen out in the country with these mountains in the background. And I mean, it just looks absolutely Hollywood. It's gorgeous. So uh, if you have that goal, keep up with it. Because, um, you know, Dr. Berg only yells at me like five times a week. It used to be like 15 when he lived in suburbia. So it is really had no. He's it just absolutely as mellow as you see him on there. But uh, but it's it's good for him, and he has great beef and all that stuff. But no, it's a spectacular farm. Uh, again, I, I have no uh, there's no question why he moved there. It's just beautiful. Uh, let's see other people wanting more of your beef. Suddenly, it's a big thing. Um, let's see. We went through the half moons. Uh, Oh, here we go. Beverly from Facebook. Can keto and intermittent fasting help with recovery from thyroid removal? I would. If I had my thyroid uh, removed, I would uh, get on keto for sure. Um, one point about that, if you don't have a thyroid, I know there's this um, push to just take Synthroid, but realize that um, you need more than just the T4 you need the whole package. I would probably recommend finding a doctor that can work with you to put you on the armor thyroid or other types of thyroid that involve um, all the all the hormones, uh, T3 as well as calcitonin, because um, you know T4 in synthroid is um, the inactive hormone. It's the inactive hormone, so it has to be converted. So you know. If you can, if you can do that, it might be a little bit better. And then, um, I'll have to do a video more on that, but yes, I would do keto for sure. in intermittent fasting. All right. That's terrific. Let's see. Um, boy, Carrie's, uh, power went out. He's running on emergency power and still working the internet. So that's great. It was snowing up there, I guess. Let's see. We, uh, did that. And let me look again. Uh, do we have any answers to questions? I'm sure that is coming up. Um, oh, here we go. Giad from Facebook. What are the best natural sources of vitamin B1? Um, um, sunflower seeds. Okay. Uh, that's a good source. Um, B1 actually is in, um, animal and, um, some plant, but our, but our guts, our guts make B1 too. Um, I think if you're eating healthy, you really just need to worry about um, the foods that deplete B1 more than the foods that have B1. And that would be uh, the high carb diet, the rice, things like that, um, like the white rice. And um, also um, other things that uh, deplete like tea. If you drink a lot of tea or coffee, that can deplete the B1. Um, if you drink a lot of alcohol, okay, that can deplete B1. This is why uh, like nearly all alcoholics are very deficient in B1. And then you get a lot of the major diseases from that. Um, but doctors don't really look for the B1 deficiency unless someone is an advanced alcoholic and they have end stage, end stage liver disease. So um, let's say, for example, you're drinking wine three times a week. You're, not, you're just depleting your B right down. And all of a sudden you find out, geez, why am I so grouchy lately? Or why is, um, why do I feel so irritated? Why do I feel so stressful? Well, because you just depleted your B1. So um, a lot of things can deplete B1. So I will, you know, I have videos on that. All right, very good. Let's see. Uh, now, if Terry gets his internet back, he said his power went out. Um, we went through that. We love that you have a farm. I'll talk that. I'll talk while you're looking for a question, Steve. I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, some videos that I'll be doing coming up here. One really interesting video is I'm going to show you one of the most uh, potent uh, natural COX-2 inhibitors. So, you know, there are people that take um, aspirin, Tylenol, 
um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for, for pain and headaches. And um, the problem is there's some slight minor complications, um, like, you know, bleeding in your stomach internally, ulcers, gastritis, cancer, things like that. Um, so there just happens to be um, natural COX inhibitors out there and that have virtually no side effects that in some studies show that they work just as good as these drugs. Now you're probably saying, well, why aren't they promoted? Because you can't patent them and you can't make money on them. Yet the studies show that they work. And so, I mean, come on, if you're going to have a choice between a natural versus a synthetic, you know, go for the natural. I'm going to be releasing a video on that this week. I already did the video. Um, so if you happen to be on this uh, drug and um, you want an alternative, you know, I'm going to give you an option. That's uh, one of the best ones, um, which is actually very interesting. Something that to replace aspirin. Um, I mean, aspirin also literally destroys that lining, that mucus lining of your, of your gut. Um, probably why it causes ulcers, but also that happens in the large intestine too. So here you are really destroying your immune system. So unfortunately these <clears throat> medical discoveries sometimes come with a package over 50% of all drugs were designed based on these, um, plant chemicals and, uh, phytonutrients or phytochemicals that have different effects. So I'm very interested in, you know, having some organized um, booklet or something to, so you can have references, so you can go to different things to know um, alternatives to those things you're trying to create effects on. Okay, very good. I am into the raw, this is funny. So Terry, our producer, feeds me questions and he, um, uh, allows me to avoid the raw <laughs> data that comes through social media. Now, boys, we I know we've been fascinated since we were little kids on our peepees, but there's a lot of peepee -pee questions, penis questions here, which I'm sure really don't have uh, any level of sincerity. Some of them do. Uh, one of them just seems so earthy I'm not going to ask, but there's plenty of other questions. So uh, let's go to one of those. Are dark circles and hollowness hollowness a result of liver kidney issue or thyroid issues i guess that's dark circles under their eyes yeah yeah um it can be it can definitely be that uh it it can also be a kidney problem it could be anemia um so it really depends on you know it's not as simple as having this one symptom and this one cause like it could be several things so this is why you have to try things and <clears throat> of course um um it could be that you're anemic um these are all common things um it also can be that you know you're inside too much and you have no sun and uh, you have lack of sleep and you have these bags underneath your eyes that could be one cause too Let's see now. Okay, a lot of people recommending pot for stuff. Uh, remember, I'm in the raw, unedited area. Um, oh, here we go. Do, uh, eating eggs every day cause sensitivity. That's kind of a, uh, didn't give much details there. Anybody allergic to eggs, Doc? Yeah, yeah, you can have, a, be, have an allergy to the egg, uh, the protein in eggs. But uh, typically, though, if you have a good, healthy egg, boy, is it solve a lot of nutritional deficiencies. There's so many great things in eggs, uh, especially if you get the pasture raised eggs. Now this year, Steve, <clears throat> I'm going to try an experiment because I don't know if you've ever heard of a brush hog. A brush hog is uh, something you kind of, you can, you can cut down weeds with it. Right. And uh, when I cut down weeds, um, boy, you start seeing millions and millions and millions of grasshoppers and bugs and things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting my chickens in those fields with all those bugs so they can start eating the bugs because I bet you anything, the eggs would taste even better if they lived on more bugs, even though we let them roam around, but um, there sure is a lot more bugs in the pastures than there is in other places. So uh, I'll let you know what happens on that one, Steve. Go get them, go get them uh, chickens. Let's see. Um, is bovine collagen healthy to take? What's that doc? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, that's a uh, cow collagen. 
Um, some people, you know, swear by it. Some people hate it. Um, if it's a grass fed, grass finished cow, I mean, I think it'd be a great thing. Um, you know, people say, well, I wouldn't want to eat the, the collagen from the hoof or whatever, or a different part of, um, the body. Well, nose to tail. I think that eating the whole animal is a, is a better thing than just having the animal meat itself, the skeletal muscle. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, definitely. Okay. Let's see. Uh, you know, we never got some answers back on the best blood tests for cancer because of the internet problem. Can you uh, maybe clue us in yeah. doc and educate us? Yeah. So, so there's a test, um, that you, sometimes you have to request it. Okay. They don't normally do this. Um, it's called uh, lactate dehydrogenase. Okay. Lactate dehydrogenase. This is a very interesting test. I think it's very valuable. It doesn't tell you specifics, but it gives you generally what's happening to your cells because this enzyme is in cells. It's in the, inside the cell. And when you rupture the cell because the, the cell is damaged or it's ruptured or it dies, you get an increase in this enzyme. And it's a, it's a pretty good indicator that there's cancer going on. And the more you have of this enzyme, the more you have this cancer. Now, <clears throat> it could mean other things too. It could mean that you have just had a heart attack, stroke, liver disease, kidney disease. Uh, it could mean that you're on a certain medication. It could mean that you just had an intense exercise bout. But let's say you, you, you didn't have these other things, right? It could be a real simple screening of cancer that you can then maybe catch it in time and do something about it. But it can also be used as a, um, a way to determine if a treatment, any treatment is working or not. Because if that enzyme is going down, it means that there's less rupturing or dying of your cells. So I'll, I'll release a video on it. It's an important um, test that the next time you get your blood test is called lactate dehydrogenase. It's a that enzyme is produced when you're making lactase, which is a different pathway involved with cancer, which I'm not going to get into the chemical uh, name or pathway, but um, cancer, uh, one thing about cancer is it, it's, it uses a different uh, um, metabolic pathway um, and it, it, it grows really fast. It hogs a lot of the sugar. And um, I think for those of you that don't have cancer, you should start to eat as if you have cancer and really try to prevent it because once you get it, it's a lot harder to get rid of it. You can still get rid of it if you do a lot of fasting, but boy, it's much easier to prevent it. So I think going forward into this next year, you might want to add that to your goal of um, being so healthy that you're bulletproof against these type of illnesses. And with the right knowledge, you can do it. Wonderful. Uh, this question answer thing is so much fun. Why don't we do it again, Doc? Here's the true false story. And why don't you educate us on the answer? Okay. Having normal vitamin D levels in your blood is the best way to ensure you have adequate cellular vitamin D. Is that true or false? I'm going to say it's false. All right. Well, do you want me to answer it now or should yeah. we wait? No, because uh, we can't get an answer. We're about a minute out, so okay. I'd love to hear it. So, so, you know, I've had people tell me this, well, I don't need vitamin D because I have normal levels in my blood. Yet you look at their symptoms and they have, their parents have all these symptoms of vitamin D, like autoimmune and arthritis, you know, like MS and Hashimoto's, and they have um, um, asthma and all these symptoms of a low vitamin D level, yet yet they have normal levels. Well, it just so happens that um, there's, in order for the cell, see, just, just because you have enough vitamin D in your blood does not tell you what's going on in the cell. Uh, what allows the vitamin D to go in the cell is through the vitamin D receptor. And it just so happens that um, there's a good portion of the population, 30% of the population that has a genetic problem with vitamin D receptor, with receiving vitamin D, and I am one of them. So I can't just um, get by on a usual amount of vitamin D. I have to take more. And that is the solution, is just to take more than normally pe people would take. 
That's how you override and drive this vitamin D into the cell. Um, so there's various clues that your body gives you um, that you need vitamin D, regardless of how much you have in your blood, like inflammation, like low back pain, like a persistent infection. Um, also, these microorganisms, especially viruses, have a strategy of, they know if you get enough vitamin D, they're dead. So what they do is they actually have a way of manipulating your cells to block the vitamin D from going in your cells. Huh. Um, and then in the video that I'll release this week, I'll talk about all the things you can do to increase that vitamin D receptor so it, 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 it takes in more vitamin D. So um, any, any who, uh, I appreciate all of your attention. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday. Um, <clears throat> stay warm. And uh, we will talk to you next week, <clears throat> next Friday, same time, same place.